is, uh, is there a person who's radically changed the course of your life but has absolutely no idea? That's a good question, man. Yeah. Well, I think the obvious one, the first thing that comes to mind is Dimebag. I know that we're uh, we're on, we're talking about guitars and stuff, but that, that seems pretty obvious. But yeah, never, never met him. Never, uh, like he would, he doesn't know I exist. But yeah, I think his playing style and his sort of attitude to life has rubbed off on me quite a bit when I was growing up. I think I got into Pantera and like Dimebag's playing and stuff at that age where you're super like impressionable. And it just sort of stayed with me in the adulthood. But yeah, Dimebag, I guess. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one. The the he, the guy um uh he mentioned uh so it's Mikey Demas from Skindred that asked you that question. Oh yeah, no Mikey. Um, I feel like we've sort of inverted the the gin- he's gone from like long ginger beard and now and <laughs> no hair to like ginger hair and no beard. I guess is what I suppose you got the tash. I guess. Um, I feel like we've swapped. Swap sides, but um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a pretty impressive beard, man. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, he was saying about like teachers and stuff, how they, um, you know, but I guess, yeah, yeah, Dimebag, I suppose there's probably a lot of people that would give that that kind of answer in some way, some sort of guitar. I suppose Van Halen, because he he influenced Dimebag, didn't he? He was like the guy, I guess, maybe all roads go back to Van Halen. I don't know who influenced Van Halen, I don't know where that I wasn't around back then, man. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you think of the uh, Pantera reunion? Um... Uh, mixed feelings, man. Like, I've, I was lucky enough to see it. We played in Japan. I played two festivals with them. Um, so, like, I'd never seen them back in the day. So it was, like, massive for, like, all of us. None of us had seen them. So it was cool to just hear those songs and, like, hear Phil singing them. But it's also not the same. Like, Zach's great. I think he's a great choice for it. And Charlie's in insane drummer um, but you know I wish they'd done this 10 years ago when like Vinny was still alive at least but you know, I enjoyed it like we had a good time we had a few pints loving hearing the songs live but I don't know it's not the same it's not the same yeah but, I always I always said I would I'd love to see Vinny Rex and Phil with Zach but then when yeah. without Vinny as well again as much as Charlie's like a fantastic drummer um I don't know. It's whenever a band starts to get into the point where half or even less sometimes of the members are the sort of original or the ones that were in the band when it really like took off. Um, yeah, because loads of bands have original members that like played pub gigs with them and stuff, you know. Um, but like beyond that, sometimes I feel like you start to, I don't know, unless it really becomes its own thing again, you sort of, you know, I don't know. Are they planning on doing music, you know, or? There was chat about that, but yeah. I don't know if it's a great idea, but you know, I'm here for it, but yeah, it, it's the closest thing I'll ever get, so I'll take it. That's that's kind of my mindset. I'm like, it's as close as I'm going to get to to hearing Walk. Like, I remember I was at Download Festival and it was just, they were just putting it on at the, uh, this was years ago, and it was just on at like the, the tent before, um, uh, but, you know, before the, all the, it was on a Thursday or something, and uh, and they played Walk, and it was obviously like loud as hell. I was like, "That's this is about the closest I've ever got to hearing Walk live," and it's just through a huge PA, and that's it. Like, um, I remember hearing it like that's probably about as close as I'll get. But then, obviously, now the reunion thing, I guess. That's yeah, like obviously, Zach changes a bunch of parts to like suit his playing style, and like at the time, that sort of annoyed me. And I was like, "I oh, just play it like Dimebag," but the more I think about it, it's like it's big shoes to fill, and obviously, he's gonna want to put his own stamp on it. Like, of course, he is. So I, I kind of get that like, after taking a step back and looking at it, like, yeah, it's, it's, he can't play exactly like Dimebag, and why should he? You know, yeah, I think he was picked for a very specific reason. I don't think he was picked to be a carbon copy. You know, I think if yeah. you if you picked uh, someone like Wes Houck, right, who's like obviously he could he, people you know, if you heard him play Pantera that, stuff. That was like, like the first name that we all like said who like could have done it. Wes mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah, but then the question is, do you want the... Because you've got the kind of personal tie, haven't you, with Zach? So it's like it's a different... You, you, you're you given a different thing, which I, I don't know, to me... I don't know whether I'd rather... Because a carbon copy, there are probably loads of guitarists out there, even guitarists that don't don't even play gigs that could do a pretty good like note-for-note kind of thing. But then at that point, I'm like, 
I could just be listening to the recording almost. Whereas if it's someone else that's putting their own stamp, that's no sort of shitting on words. I don't mean it like that. I just mean hearing someone that's got a personal tie to him, I think for me, maybe it's more important. I don't know. Yeah, they needed a big name as well, I think. Like, obviously, Zach's well known and has been for years. So mm. it makes it a bit easier for fans to accept that, I think, when it's an established, well known guitarist. Yeah, I suppose Pantera fans, if they if it's on like Wes got announced, they might be like, "Who's this guy?" You know. Um, yeah. What would you do if you were called upon to to do the shows? How would you how would you go about it? First of all, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> but oh, I don't know, man. I think I'd probably be the guy who would try and play it note for note, mm. just because I don't want to disappoint people. Yeah, but you know, I, I can't play like that, man. So. Well, there's a probably a, there's a lot of people a lot further down the list than you for sure. Like, I think uh, you know. There's um with speaking of your like um this this sort of songwriting style and how you've because I've heard you talk about how he sort of influences what you what you do and I noticed some, something that I really like in your guys' songs and particularly in the guitar stuff is the sort of the technicality where it, where it merits it. I feel and then the sort of sitting back with some of the riffs and just taking it easy and just putting the riff there, like put, putting in the riff that the song wants, if that makes sense, or, you know, building the song around a riff that that you hear it once or twice and you're like, okay, I know what this is, you know. Um, do, do you consciously kind of think about how you're balancing in this, the kind of techie stuff with the the more like stompy, catchy, headbangy kind of things, or is it is that just natural to you, like? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a conscious choice. Like, I think as we're getting older and we're playing more shows and we're gearing writing more towards the live show and, like, stuff like stompier stuff and less technical stuff comes off better live. It feels better to play. The crowd react to it more, so we're, we're sort of naturally just going in that direction. But, like, I think people listen to us for a bit of the technical guitar stuff as well, so we always make a conscious choice to put bits and bobs in there but like playing it live is obviously a nightmare because you're just like staring at your fretboard that you can't just rock out and put on a show so it's about finding that balance but I'd, I'd say we're definitely gearing towards more simple stuff but yeah still being tastefully technical if that's the right term yeah I think the sugar is sort of doing that from what I understand because I don't, I don't think they play bleed live anymore that's no. my understanding because I think they're kind of getting on a bit and they're like and I think if you listen to the, the latest songs they're a bit more like they're still techy in a rhythmic sense and in like a um, feel sense but I think in terms of the actual physical playing of it I don't know if it's quite as challenging as some of the older stuff with all the gallops and the herta beats and stuff like that um, yeah, yeah is it, I know you were saying about um, sort of with your live shows that being a big part of it for you like the, the, the live performance and that would do you think you'd ever you know in an alternate universe would you ever be tempted to do like um more of the session type stuff that's based like almost entirely around like the live performance is that something that that would ever kind of i suppose in the metal world there's not so much of that but um is that something you know with the live performance being such an important part is that something that would ever sort of excite you or if you know if you were called on to do i don't know well pantera there you go you like do but something like that you know like a more metal sessioning is that something yeah, that you'd for, for sure man yeah i mean anything that's sort of live based i'd be up for it you know if i had the time like please are pretty busy but mm. you know that's, that's definitely something i'd be interested in for sure man like like that's all we want to do is play shows like i feel like writing and recording is just a sort of means to an end and the end being touring and playing shows so that's sort of the ultimate goal yeah but yeah that's definitely something that, like i've been asked to do stuff but then couldn't do it because it was busy or whatever but yeah well up for that sort of thing in the future if it ever comes about yeah but it's, it's um it's interesting that the kind of the songs um i know obviously when you say sort of means to an end i know it's not that the songs you just like i'll oh, just throw something together and go live i know it's not like that but um it's it's interesting how much of an emphasis you've you place on the the live shows um i think a lot of people especially nowadays where a lot of, there's a lot of people that are quite secluded and just kind of the music stays kind of in the in the studio or in the bedroom or wherever it is that they're sort of writing stuff um and then the, almost the live show is like the oh we got to do that cuz we've written all these songs and we need to perform them do, do you know if there's any reason why 
for you, it's kind of almost like the inverse of that. Is there something about you that's just like naturally you've always just wanted to perform? Is there some sort of like, I'm not trying to go into some deep psychological reason, unless there is one, you know? Um, we, we started playing shows from like when we were, we first started. And I think we've played way more shows than you would normally play for the amount of albums we've had. Like, we've done more touring than we've done albums, basically. Mm. But uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know why. It's just once you experience it, I think you just want more. You've been spoiled with all these shows and you just want to do it more and more and more. And to do that, you, you like, you have to write. I mean, I say that you have to write. Like, I, I love writing. I'm passionate about writing. I love sitting in, I should do like, playing music, recording music, but at the end of the day, it's all for touring. And that's, that's just that really. Yeah. Do you, do you ever, um, are there ever shows where you, where you do sort of go into that sort of autopilot, but like not in a good way, that kind of like where you're going through the motions. Do you ever find if you're on a long tour, there are those days where you just kind of feel like you're just going, getting through it or, or is there always that, does that excitement kind of override all of that kind of stuff? Uh, you definitely do get those days, especially if it's a long tour. Like we we just done like, like eight weeks in the states there, and like all the shows were incredible. But yeah, you do you do tend to get into that sort of mindset. But if you have like a really good crowd one night, you're you just sort of remember like that every night is different, and these people are seeing you for the first time, and you have to you have to give them a show, and like we. Even the amount of touring we've done this year, we, we've basically been on tour since February. Like even now, we go into a show with the same passion as we did back at the start of the year. Like it's because every show is different, and you totally feed off the energy of the crowd. So if you have a particularly good crowd, that stands out. And if they're having a good time, you're having an even better time. Yeah. Do you've got have you got any like mad or funny tour stories from the US? I mean, like eight weeks. Surely something's gone wrong, or or. Uh... I don't know. Oh, yeah. Or anything you can tell on a podcast, at least, you know. <laughs> like... I don't know. A lot I probably can't talk about <laughs> the podcast. Yeah, it, it was a slog, man, but in a good way, like, because it was four weeks on, four weeks off, then four weeks on again, but in the middle we went to Japan, so we didn't really have much time off in the month that was supposed to be time off, but, and then we were only back from that for a few weeks, and then we just went out with a Marth, just back from that for a few days. Then next week we're away again for seven weeks doing festivals and then on tour with Trivium. So it's just been sort of non-stop, man. It's been a bit of a blur, but I, I just, I'm not complaining. Like this is what we wanted. So it's finally, we're seeing the sort of fruits of labor, I guess. Yeah. I heard, um, was it at Wolverhampton? I saw, I saw something about someone like jumping off of the, um, like jumping into the crowd or something. I don't know if it was your set or the, with a yeah, monomar. Yeah, it was a monomar set. Someone like jumped off the balcony. I think they were all right. Quite a drop, but... Well, I think yeah, it was more that they injured, or they, well, could have injured whoever was going to fall on, you know. Um, yeah. I feel like there's, I get the crowd surfing thing, but like it's crowd surfing, not like crowd landing. I don't know. I feel yeah. like that's kind of next like, level there. In, in the States, I think it was like the second or third show. In Atlanta, the the loadout bit had like a sort of public walkway above it. It was quite high, and um, we were loading out, and Ali was just like walking out the back door with his drum stuff, and someone I don't know if they jumped or fell off this railing and landed like a meter from him, like almost crushed him. Luckily, the guy was all right. Like there was an EMT on hand to, to help, but yeah, that happened on like day two of the US tour. So we nearly lost a drummer. Oh shit! That's uh, yeah, yeah. We do, that's kind of. I feel like that beer has to have been, or some sort of alcohol has to have been involved in that, whether it's a fall or a jump. Like, yeah, I don't know the whole story. I think he'd been like ejected from the venue, and uh, like police were chasing him or something. So, oh, yeah. Oh shit! That's... I think he's all right. <laughs> it's interesting to uh, chase that lead, I guess. Yeah. How was the? Um, what do you make of like the US? Have you have you guys done much over in the US to this point? Because um, I, I think have you been over before a couple of times? No, uh, that that was our first ever tour in the US. Oh, cool! What did so, you make of the sort we, of uh, incredible man? Like that we've been a band for like eighteen years now, and that's our first ever shows in the US, which is pretty mental. But we've just never had the right offer, or we've been too busy doing our stuff. But that's just like fitted perfectly, and 
Yeah, yeah, it was incredible, man. Like, I, I don't know what to make of it because uh, everyone always tells you the first time you go to the US, it's like super hard, really long drives. You don't get treated well. Like, you don't know how your band's going to be down, going down, especially if you're opening. But honestly, man, it was incredible. Like, every show was nuts. And I think people just go extra nuts for the Scottish thing. They just love the Scottish thing. They have no idea what you're saying, but they still love it. But no, nah, the, the shows are nuts. Like, yeah. Some of them felt like headline shows, even though you're the opening band and people have never seen you before. But yeah, people, I think people really latched onto that, the fact that it was the first time and how long we've been a band and the whole Scottish thing, like we had t-shirts with Scotland flags on and stuff. Like, I just love that because everyone, everyone in the States is like half Scottish or quarter Scottish or something. They just love talking to you about that. So it's cool to just meet everyone after the shows and people are so happy that you made the trip. But we're already going back. We're going back early next year. It's not announced yet, but yeah, can't like so genuinely can't wait to go back. Yeah, is that? Can you talk about any of that at all or no? Uh, not really. Okay. Only it's another support tour. <laughs> okay. It's early next year. The tour's not even been announced yet. So wow. yeah. Ah, yeah. We're, we're actually going back next month to do Blue Ridge Fest. Oh yeah. You've probably seen the poster online. It's like every band ever. Mm, I think uh, I've seen that. Yeah. Our days like. Lama God, Cody Taylor, Bad Omens. Look, yeah, it's not. We're, yeah. we're just going over for one one day and come back. And then we've got the Lama God cruise in November. Yeah, we're going to the Bahamas, so that's not as well. It's kind of <laughs> that's crazy. A, that's I, the thing that's happening. Yeah, there's something about like the heavy metal in the Bahamas just sounds so, it sounds like two kind of opposites, you know. Like, it's, I don't know why to me, like, sort of goths in the Bahamas just seems a bit like, yeah. uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, oh, man, like the clothing. Out in the sea, man, there'll just be, like, six Scottish guys in the shades just <laughs> hating their life. Yeah. Sunburnt. I feel like the clo- the attire, like, there's going to have to, you know, normally, it's, it's, I'm sort of stereotyping, but, you know, black jeans and a hoodie and the all of that are probably going to have to come off. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah, not planning on being outside much on that because we will burn to a crisp with our... Scottish skin. You could go for the dime bag look, to be fair, like the camo shorts and the, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Do you think you could ever, could you ever rock a guitar as wild as like the ML or like the Razorback type thing? Like not that guitar, but something as, you know, I know Josh, um, the Silosis Josh has got, he's, he's got quite a mad uh, ESP, isn't it? He's got a crazy yeah. looking thing. Could you rock I, something I, like I, that? I'd love a flying V, man. I would really genuinely love a flying V. I don't know if I could pull it off, but give it a go. Because, like, Alexei from Bottom was, like, one of my favourite guitarists growing up. And he always had that white flying V with the gold hardware. I think that's where my whole love of white guitars with gold hardware comes from as well. But I'd, I'd love a flying V, man. But yeah. I've never actually played one. I don't know if it'd be comfortable. I'm sure I've picked one up and kind of... I don't think I've played one for more than about five minutes, really. Um, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people are kind of influenced by, like, I'm a big Tremonti fan and I've got PRS, you know, and now I just, I've done so much of my playing on a PRS that it's just kind of feels like home, I think. Um, I know, it's like, because he had like the Randy Rhodes V, didn't he? The sort of the, the yeah. shark fin looking thing. Um, yeah. And like, Tremonti's got this kind of, I think he's got like three of them or something. It's like a PRS Explorer. Have you seen it? No, I don't think so. Oh, it looks amazing. It's like a, you know what the obviously Gibson Explorer looks like. It's, it's like a sort of a wavy version. There's no hard edges to it. It's like a very, um, I don't know, I'm sort of gesticulating with my hands off camera. It's not very useful. Um, but it's very like rounded and kind of, um, I don't know. There's something about uh, uh, Explorer to me just looks so, well, I think of like Hetfield as well. It just looks mm. so like, you know, I am here. This is, you know, it's very like, establishing your presence kind yeah, of guitar it takes a certain personality to put off that you have to be a presence mm. to be able to hold a guitar like that you can't just be some wee guy that's holding this mad looking guitar like you have to earn it yeah I there's certain guitars there yet, but yeah there's certain guitars you really have to earn i think yeah yeah, yeah. what do you if, what's the like ultimate guitar that you have to i think something like an ml or a razorback particularly because yeah, a dime back sure. Yeah, I don't know what especially because it's got that history attached to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because something like a Les Paul or a Strat, I guess it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. I, feel like I, I thought, I thought um, Zach would have some of Dime's guitars at least, but it didn't. It was all his. It's a sort of mad shape. His. It's got the spiral pattern on it. It's not the Razorback, but it's 
similar ish. He's done. Have you seen the lightning bolt wild guitar? It's like it, it's it's uh it's his. I think it's like called the ZV, where it's like the um or the ZV. I guess they probably call it where it's got like the Gibson SG horns, but then the the V out the back, and he's yeah, got he's got the lightning. Been, may have been those you heard. Yeah, and he's then he's got the lightning print, like you know the 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 washburn blue and sort of white lightning kind of um um white lightning's a drink, isn't it? I don't know. Is it? It's, I feel like that's a, is that a, I don't, why do I feel like that's a Scottish thing? I think it's like a cider that homeless people is favoured amongst homeless <laughs> oh, people. Oh, sorry. Okay. Why, <laughs> yeah, why do I feel like that's a Scottish thing? <laughs> I think it is. I think you're right. Yeah. That and Buckfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've never... I, I still don't think I've ever had Iron Brew. Oh, mate. You need to do something about that immediately. What sort of occasion... Not okay, I don't think it's an occasion drink, but like what sort of scenario is Iron Brew like best suited to? Hangover, first of oh, all. Oh, okay. Helps because if it's high sugar content, it used to have more sugar, more sugar in it, but they had to like reduce the sugar because it was like a sugar tax came in or something. Yeah, it would have been too expensive to make. But um, yeah, hangover or just any time, man, it's it's it sells more than Coca Cola in Scotland. <laughs> so you know that that can't be for no reason. It's incredible. Have Have you heard people in the states trying to pronounce it? Because obviously it's it's own brew on the on the thing, isn't it? Yeah. If you... uh, that's that's not so much the hard one for them. It's when we say stuff like, uh, like food, they they can't <laughs> really like what food food. What is food? Or or girls is a hard one. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah, it sounds like girls. Yeah, uh, girls. <laughs> or the the name Carol, like K A R L, just sounds like Carol. I thought you said, <laughs> I thought you said Carol. <laughs> yeah, because. Yeah, I guess you would say like Carl. Yeah, yeah. We don't have that sound. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird having a language barrier with two English-speaking countries. The idea of that's yeah, quite funny. It's not something. Yeah, like our, our first big tour was us. All that remains, soil work, Niera and Heaven. No, not Heaven Shoreborn. There was another Jer- Caliban. Um, so there was like two German bands, Swedish band, American band, and us. And all that remains, the Americans were just like. I can understand the Germans more than we can understand you, like, which is just nuts. I think most most Europeans they learn a sort of an American accented version of English, don't they? A lot of the time, yeah. you often hear an, an American accent in European, and often in uh, sort of uh, sort of from Asian countries. People from Asian countries quite often learn an American style of English. Yeah, it's from like know. movies and TV shows and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. If it's, is it easier to understand than? British, like British English, I suppose British English kind of varies quite, quite widely, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that's a thing you hear in America quite a lot, like a British accent. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not a thing. Yeah, it's kind of it's a bit... about fifty British accent. Yeah, whereas like that, that said, I hear an American accent, and I, 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 there's some variation. There's some quite heavy variation, but I still kind of, I don't know, Boston versus Texas versus like West Coast. I still kind of hear it as an American accent. I don't know if that's me just being. Yeah, I think that's oh, the, something we notice, like how different it is as you move around the country, like the deep south, like Florida is like very different to like Boston, even though they're not that far apart, really. Yeah. Did you encounter any Florida men? You know, yeah. like the whole Florida man does this, was, you know, um, use or whatever. We were playing a festival and it was like right on a lake, so there was like gator guards, because there was gators in the lake, so yeah. there was guys there and we got speaking to one of those guys and he was hilarious, man. Just like stereotypical what I do. Yeah, nice. that's, that's pretty nuts. They, yeah. they have no idea what we we're saying, but we somehow managed to communicate. Yeah, just sign language or something. Yeah, with it, when it comes to like touring, you know, I know you've done a lot of it this or and you've got more going on. Um, is there, it, I know it's kind of what you, it seems to be what you guys kind of live for, really, with like from what you talked about, but it, it, does that, are there ever moments on tour? like the more difficult or things i mean you know you're in the same bus or hotel as the same other four other guys for you know um for a long time and obviously just doing the same thing every day all the traveling um how do you kind of keep i don't know i'll say keep going that sounds a little bit too motivational speakerish, but you know how do you keep yourself just on the level like um as a group it, you definitely have those days on tour man like at least once every couple of weeks. But I think it's important to 
just go and spend time by yourself because you don't get that on tour a lot. You're in the bus with everyone, you're in the venue with everyone, there's always people around. But if you've got time in the morning, just like go off a walk by yourself, just go listen to a podcast or some music or whatever, or just, or just like lie in your bunk and watch a film on your own instead of staying up partying. Like just having those little moments to yourself definitely help on tour because it's not often. But if you, if you make it happen, then it, it definitely helps get by because when you're living in that small space, you, you get sick of each other. Like everyone has arguments and stuff, but you you know that it's it's not coming from a bad place. Everyone knows it's because you're in this small space together and you have been for a long time. So once you like take yourself away from it for like an hour or whatever, then you can like clear your head and you're like, oh yeah, they weren't being a dick. It's just because we've been living together and you, you just get over it because you, you have to because you're, you're going to be around these people for a long time. So you, you just have to get on with them and you, you just learn to get on with them. Yeah, you you guys. I'm not saying I don't like my bandmates and <laughs> the crew. I love them all. I love them all dearly. Yeah, I know you guys. Obviously, been a band for a long time. And um, has the has the dynamic kind of changed in any way? Like, um, that's a bit of a sort of vague question, but you know, particularly in the last year, where you've you know, um, obviously off the sort of success of the last release and then all this touring has like the way that you guys operate, has it changed in any way? Like, do some people do more of this or less of this or like just your social kind of, you know, do you kind of, do you guys get yourselves like click better? I'm guessing you already have to click pretty well to be doing it that long, but. Yeah, we know each other inside out by this stage. So you know how everyone works. Um, Like Ali, our drummer, he's, he's our manager basically. Um, So he's super, super busy and he, he does everything for us. Like he's a, he's our tour dad. He he sets everything up, so we 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 sort of make ourselves available to him whenever he, he needs help and stuff. Because he does a lot. Because he's the drummer in the band, he's managing the band. He's got a full time job, so it's a lot for him. So we all try and like get around and support him because there's a lot for us. Like we'd be fucked with it, Ali man. He, he genuinely does everything for us. So yeah, thanks, Ali. <laughs> yeah, how's does his um? You know, he's got quite a unique kind of style but does do you feel like his style how much you know i suppose you could apply this to everyone in the band really but um how much do you think his style sort of influences the band and then how much do you think the band maybe has sculpted not just what he does but kind of what what everyone does because i know i know for a fact so like the last band i was in i know myself and the drummer kind of i feel like our our sort of stylistic brains kind of bounced off of each other and he would just naturally start to do more things that he knew that I thought were good. And I think vice versa, I would write riffs that sort of turned around in a way that that he would probably say, oh, you should put that bit on the end or you should, you know. Um, how do you feel like your sort of creative brains have sort of sculpted each other? Yeah, definitely. Like it's always, it's always been me and Ali since we started that have been the main writers. And then more recently, Stephen, when he's joined for the last three albums. Um, but there's, there's. I'll write a song and Ali will like change the drum parts and stuff. But there's been times where I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do next, and I'll go to him and say like, what, what would you do in the drums after this part? And he'll just be like, oh, I would do this kind of drum beat. I'm like, right, okay, so I'll like program that in and then write something to, like the idea that he's come up with. Or sometimes he will just send like MIDI drums that he's programmed, like a beat that he likes, like a groove. Be like I really love playing this. Can you write something to it? So it goes both ways. Like it's it's quite collaborative in that way. That's that's sort of how it's always been, but more so in the last couple albums. Hmm. Do do you, um? I always find it difficult writing a riff to a drum beat. I don't know why. Um, it feels quite restrictive, which is obviously a lot of the time that's kind of what you need. But I think my my guitar brain's like, no, I need to, you know, I need freedom. When actually, a lot of the time, you probably don't want that when you're writing. You need some sort of do you, do you find writing to a groove is quite doable or is that do you find that trickier than just like sitting with your guitar yeah i mean there's there's like loads of different ways of writing and that's one of them that we've done we don't do it a lot but like that's how sovereign the second song on the latest album train that's how that was written it was just a drum beat that ali sent me that he'd been playing just a groove that he liked we sort of wrote around that i think he actually sent me a voice note of him like humming a riff over it it ended up actually pretty similar to the voice note but um, yeah, that happens. That's happened more and more. But then there's times where there'll be a riff 
it's probably how most guitarists write. You you're just playing around with your guitar and you come up with something. You're like, oh right, just something you like playing that, that feels good. Or there's the type of writing where you will have an idea in your head. That's this is how most of my writing is. Like you have an idea in your head or like a voice in it that you've made, and you want to you, you need to try and realize that on a guitar. So it starts in your head and then you try and play it on a guitar. That's where most of my songs come from. I think. Mm. But, yeah, there's like that's at least three ways that we write. Yeah, I feel like there's definitely something I've noticed. I, I was uh, so I teach guitar, and I was talking to a student yesterday. He brought a riff that he wanted to learn. Um, they're quite a, they're quite a popular band in the sort of metal, very modern techie metal world, and um, he's quite interested in songwriting as well. Um, and I felt like something that I feel a lot of guitarists do nowadays is they will write. Um, well, I feel most engaged when I'm playing something that's technical enough that I have to concentrate, but not so technical that like I'm just hanging on for dear life. But that that isn't always the type of thing I like to listen to. So I find quite often it's really tempting to write the riff that is engaging to write in the moment because I'm, you know, my brain's switched on. But then you actually sit back and listening is not the same mental state as writing. So then you sit back, you listen, you're like, what the fuck's that? Because, you know, obviously you, you, your brain is, appreciates things differently when you're not actually doing it. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's something you can kind of relate to. I'm sure I could probably make a question out of that, but my, my brain farted. But you know what I mean? Like that kind yeah, of... Yeah, like I think it's important to like take a step back and like we're trying to not worry about it too much as we write, like not get too nitpicky and technical about stuff. And just if you like the feel of something, even if like listening to it back like isn't as easy as it is to play it then it's like don't worry about it if you like it just put it in the song like someone out there will will latch on it and will like it but like we we write for us we don't write for anyone else like we write stuff that the five of us like and that should be enough like if you love it then put it out be confident about it and put it out like someone out there will identify with it somewhere yeah, I guess it's, the other thing is it's not like it's not like you're a solo artist. You know, there's five of you, so if all five of you like it, you know, even if one of you doesn't particularly like it, the chances that between all of you, you've got enough stuff that you know there's going to be some like some one person out there, you know, or obviously more than one. But you know, when you've got the collective sort of approval of a group of five people, there's probably quite a high chance there's going to be a decent number of people in wider sort of society that like that. I guess. That's- the hardest part of writing for us is trying to please everyone in the band. Is there? Is there all like different stuff? Yeah. Is there a riff or a bit or something that you keep pushing for or have pushed for that just doesn't, for whatever reason, the guys are just like I just don't get it. Are there any? Yeah. There, have you got any? There's, like, there's one that comes to mind that I've been trying to get in an album since like Uprising, like four albums ago. It's like this sort of bouncy, in flames style verse riff. And me and Kennedy love it. And he every time we're writing, Kennedy says to me, make sure you get that riff in. But like Ali and Davey hate it. <laughs> so it's just been hard, but I will get it in one day. Yeah. Maybe that maybe the next album. We'll see. I could uh, you know, I can I can give you I could be judge and jury if you want. Like just <laughs> if you want to outsource the decision making, you know, just like send it off and just I don't know. Or you should maybe you should get uh, a um... it is great, it's like objectively great. <laughs> Just Said every guitarist like ever, I think. Like, <laughs> this riff I wrote is objectively great. Uh, I've definitely been there. Yeah, yeah maybe we... it doesn't really fly with the rest of the band, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe maybe you should outsource it. Just go like, just put it out and go. What do you? I suppose if you put it out to the internet, they'll all just go, yeah, because that's. Yeah, I feel like that's someone all of it. Yeah, I like when people put out like Instagram polls of like, should I do this? And it's always like ninety eight percent yes, and then there's that one per, or it'll be like, do you like this riff? No one's gonna. Tap no, you know. Um, I don't know. If I'm, like I'm I'm determined to get bagpipes in. I want to do that for a few albums. How would you? I suppose. How would you make that kind of work without without sounding a bit sort of like gimmicky? Like, oh, we're from Scotland, you know. I, I feel I, like I think we, that gives us the right to do it more than anyone. Oh, I don't. I don't disagree at, at <laughs> all. I, but I think making it obviously tasteful is another. Uh, another that's matter. that's the problem I'm having. I'm, I've been trying to. Or like finding a good bagpipe simulator is difficult to start with. And then there's only like a certain amount of notes and one scale that you can actually use in a bagpipe. You can't just 
like have every they don't have all the notes so and i don't know those notes so i'm trying to learn that at the moment you could uh i feel like the uh the melody in uh is it le- not levitate but is it the da, 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 da. uh and the nation yeah oh sorry yeah okay yeah I don't know, that could be bag bagpipeified possibly yeah you could do like a remix that, that that discussion came up but we felt like there was too much other stuff going on in the song with all the like industrial samples and stuff to, for it to be to stand out it would just be a mess of stuff happening yeah what what is the uh in the intro to that the kind of beat that's going on in the background what what is that kind of samples what sort i think of sound it's just that? like i think it's just like the built-in logic drum kit with like loads of distortion on the snare and then it hell. like yeah it's like a gated reverb i guess oh okay yeah it sounds almost like a limited kind of i can hear the reverb thing yeah yeah i'm not much of a, yeah, my, i can't my brain... remember what i done exactly it, yeah it was like a snare with loads of distortion and then i cut it cut the wave before the note finished so that's why it just like ends i think i've been listening to a lot of nine inch nails at the time so i was just trying to like emulate that did your brain go my, my brain just does not go to that that kind of world i don't know why i don't know if that's just a sort of uh, a lack of scope for me as a songwriter but i i'm very much guitar through and through and just kind of a um how do you you know do, do you step into that other world much the kind of more sound effect based stuff i'm i'm not too knowledgeable about it i'd love to do more of it and i do try but on the last album we got a guy called jamie involved to do we called it ad prod to like additional production just anything that's not guitars or drums and vocals basically hmm. um just noises and stuff because like he has this library of stuff and just knows how to make it sound great so i'd try stuff in logic and didn't sound great and i sent it off to him and he'd make it sound better but i think a bunch of the stuff i tried actually ended up getting kept i think once it's like mixed properly and eq'd properly and stuff then it sounds a lot better than from what i can make but i've been i've been trying a bunch of stuff lately like some new plugins like industrial sound stuff and synths and stuff but again i'm not too knowledgeable with that but there are, there's people who are who I can send it to who will make it sound good. So if I can come up with ideas, then they can make it sound good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's one of those things. I think there's only so many things you can make time for as a creative like person. And I, you know, um, I think I worry. I probably over worry to be honest. That like, oh, if I'm not doing guitar stuff. I, 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 that's not right, you know. Or I'm just going to be. Uh, but then I suppose at the same time they say. I don't know if it's a bit of a bullshit like bro science rule, but they say it takes like 20 hours to get to like a, a sort of a like entry level at anything, you know. Um, obviously, there are probably some more complex things that you need more time on, but the idea being 20 hours of something, you know, proper hours in that gets you just to like the point where you just understand it and you can do a bit of something, which is more than most people put into any skill or whatever, you know. Um, like I've probably played the drums for all of about an hour in my whole life. Um, I reckon if I sat down for 20, you know, an hour, if I even did like an hour a week, could probably get a couple of grooves just going, you know. Um, so maybe, yeah. maybe I just need to sit down and, I don't know, like. I think the tools that exist these days now is like, you don't have to, like, you've got the, like the drum sample libraries that are just sound incredible that a lot of artists probably use on their albums that we don't know about. Like, you can just program something that sounds incredible. Like. And like the guitar plug and stuff, you don't have to be a guitar geek to know how to dial in a good tone that's just there for you, like done. I think that like stuff like that's really helpful for writing because you can just sit down on your laptop and everything sounds great already. You don't have to worry about it sounding great. You just need to come up with the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that in terms of where you want to go, like writing wise or, you know, band direction, like sonically, do you have any specific things in mind sort of going forward that you think? I want us to steer more into that, whatever that is. It, we've been talking about it recently because we're, we're like full on writing the next album at the moment. Well, trying to, and we're not on tour, or sometimes when we are on tour. But I think we're talking about just more leaning on our original influences more than the, when we started the band and going back to that and trying not to. Because I think we did everything on the last album like that we could possibly think of. We got, got strings in and the ad prod stuff and just like really went for it. The last time we're trying to just go back to why we started playing music in the first place and write with that in mind. But apart from that, we don't try and think about it too much because I think you can 
it's, it can kind of be bad for you when you try and overthink. Like, just let stuff happen, and if it's good, you, you'll know. Yeah. Do you think the um, so you talk about having like a, quite a variety on the on the last album? Do you think that um, obviously that's it's rare that that's like a, a bad thing as such. But is that do you think that was born out of wanting to explore more ideas or? Did you kind of feel like, oh, we got to have this song and a bit of this and a bit of this? Is, or is it, again, is it just chasing what you want to write? Like, how natural was that kind of? I, th- I think it's the same process with every album. Like, the first half of the album, when you first start, you, d- you have no idea what it's going to sound like. You just, you're just recording ideas. You don't know how it's going to fit as an album. But once you're, like, maybe five songs in, you can start to see what the album's missing or if there's too much of one thing or not enough of another then you can start gearing towards specific things. But I feel like the start of an album writing process is just throwing shit at the wall until something sticks. I feel like that's kind of where we're at at the moment. We're just getting all our ideas out until we find something we like. And then you then you start going into specifics. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you feel like the um the visual... I know you do... Your, so for your full-time kind of gig is the visual stuff, right? The, the sort of... Yeah. Um, do you feel like the sort of creative side of that is it like a nice break in some way or you know do the two creative outlets provide like breaks almost from the other one in some way yeah for sure they are two two totally separate things i wish i had more time to play my guitar than working but that's just not how life is but um yeah it's i'd rather i'd rather be playing my guitar all the time but you get to do both, like on tour, I work a lot, but I also try and get writing in whenever you can. You're obviously, you're playing guitar every day anyway, so you're getting that sort of creative fulfillment from that side. But yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's constant, but they are two totally separate things. Mm. Does the, the kind of novelty of the touring, I'm guessing, the way I kind of picture it in my head, which might just be totally inaccurate, is first week is probably a lot of like drinking, enjoying it, and then you suddenly realise, okay, got to like, settle in a bit here does, does it happen kind of like that do you you know obviously you're getting to know people meeting them for the first time like how do you sort of settle into a tour or do, are you quite sensible from the beginning you're like no I've got to you know look after myself uh, you definitely it goes in like peaks and trough like it definitely starts with excitement at the start and you want to like party loads and get to know people and then that'll die off and then it'll go up again like you want to party more and then you'll chill more like it's just like real life really just peaks and troughs and you can party every single night and you get bored of not partying every night. So you just need to find a balance, I think. It's, I'm not saying we've found it yet, but we're more more on the party side, I think. Like it's when you say, oh, I'm not going to have a drink tonight, I'm not going to party, but then you have a great show and you're just full of adrenaline and you're, you just want to party after Ah, oh, snap. Which is, like, we've not had a bad show in like five years, so <laughs> it's difficult to not party when you're in that mindset. But yeah, I think we're sensible enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good show tonight, boys. Done it again. <laughs> like, the, yeah. like a few points during the set when before the show, we've been like, "No, nah, we're not. We're not drinking tonight. We're not partying tonight." And then after about three songs, it was amazing. Then me and Ali will look at each other and he'll go, "Yep." You know what's happening after that? Yeah, the universal sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. The um, I saw you did the visuals for "Bring Me Again." Is that right? Their yeah, down- is it, was it their download yeah. set? That's yeah, it was, really the, cool. the show is sort of leading up to download, but that was like the the yeah the lead up to download headline set. That was the big the big moment for them. Yeah. Do you ever um sort of panic a bit when you know when you know it's about to happen, or once you've done your job, is it kind of like out of your hands sort of thing? And you're like something goes yeah, wrong. Yeah, that, that's the sort of good thing with my role is once I've delivered my videos and they've been approved, then it's out of my hands. It's technical stuff. It's not my fault if it goes wrong. But yeah, l- luckily, like most most of the time, it goes without a hitch. Yeah. But we had that sort of two weeks in the lead up to download. We had a few shows to sort of test stuff and see what wasn't working. So I was just there making notes and changing stuff as we went along until it was like almost perfect at download. But download had like triple the amount of screens than the other shows had. So we didn't actually get to visualize it until download. We had some like pre production days before download because it was this. Ins- I don't know if you've seen any of this stuff, it was this insane stage set up but yeah it was like a third of that in the leading up to it so it was cool to see everything like right in front of you yeah yeah was there were there any um 
I remember you said last time there's a little Easter egg in, is it the Motley Crue video where you said Davey's in the video? Are there any... I forgot I told you about that. <laughs> yes, I've got a good memory, apparently. Um, although more and more friends lately are telling me that I keep telling them the same things all the time. So I'm a bit worried. I don't know. If oh, I get that a lot, man. That's just getting old. That's what yeah, I'm 25. Like... <laughs> You're 25? Yeah. Wow. What, do, how much older than... Do I look... I'm guessing... Do I look old? Where, how old do I look? No, you don't. I just... Uh, I thought you would have been older because you're very... you got your shit together. You <laughs> seem to have got shit together. Nah, it's all I a facade. I don't have my shit together when I was your age. It's all a facade. It's all uh, <laughs> smoke and mirrors, man. Um, make it till you make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I saw... I know... Because I think Ollie put... Was it on his Instagram? He put the visuals, like what he'd sort of drawn up. Um, how much did you kind of work with that versus just like doing your own thing like obviously he's got a bit of a looked like you had sort of a brief a fairly detailed kind of brief of what you know um is, is it difficult when you know where obviously you know how this is all going to work is it difficult when someone gives you quite a detailed thing where you've got to make something work that maybe in your head wouldn't be the first thing you'd have done if that makes sense i, th I think i prefer when people give me a brief like the, the more detailed the better mm. because if they don't then you're just guessing what they like and doing what you like and hoping they like it too but if someone knows what they want and like Ollie's very like that he's easy ideas guy so he, he knows exactly what he wants so it's easier to, you just go towards that rather than trying to guess but it has to be said there was like a team of people working on this it wasn't just me I can't take credit for all of it I just I was a small part of a big team but it's cool that's a cool way of working as well like part of a big team like collaborating with other people that, that that was a really cool way to work. It's not usually what I do. Usually it's just me doing like lyric videos in the house on my own. So that was cool to like work in a massive team of people and like everyone, like by the end of it, it's just such a massive feat that everyone's pulled off and you can be proud of everyone. Yeah, yeah. Is, it, are there any more Easter eggs? That's what I was going to ask. Are there any more Easter eggs that you've managed to dump in sort of any particular nah, videos? Or... Nah, I think that, that would have been too, too risky, I think. It's something that size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your own face in, like the just put like tiny little, like I don't know, like hundred pixel like little corner in well, the screen. I'll bleach my thin logo just at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, watermark the whole the whole <laughs> down. Nah, I, I want to keep my job, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just get a little watermark in the bottom. Just claim credit for your work. You know, that's fine. Um, just quickly, have you seen the Tesseract video? Isn't that the latest one? I haven't seen the full thing because it's a very long song. And it's a long song. I don't have time to watch the full thing, but yeah, I have seen snippets of it. It looks incredible. Yeah, I thought that was pretty wicked. I just thought I'd see if, you, if you'd seen that. Um, yeah, I've seen like uh, Amos posting stuff about the like, motion capture or stuff. Like, that's nuts. Yeah, I didn't realise until It looks that. expensive, man. That's what it, it looks expensive. That was my first thought. That was also my first thought, especially for like, it's not, again, it's a like 11 minute song. If it was like a four yeah. minute song, it might be. Because I know how much music videos cost and they're not cheap and for like a four minute song, never mind an 11 minute song, so. I, uh, yeah, I was trying to speculate how much, how much that would cost. I'm guessing, my, my guess was in the 10 to 20 grand mark was my guess. A, a lot of tenors, a lot of tenors. You think? Oh, I. Uh, oh, okay, well, I, that's a, that's a serious. Uh... I, I, I don't know, but I, I, yeah, I'd say you're about right, maybe north of that, maybe oh, towards yeah. 50. Yeah, yeah, my my small brain just thinks in like <laughs> doesn't think at that scale. Like I don't even I don't even contemplate that. I couldn't even contemplate having like anyone other than the videographer doing the video, anything in the video. You know, um, yeah. I think the I Am Damnation music video was like ten grand, and that was half of that was pyro. Oh shit! <laughs> just yeah, fire is expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the fact it doesn't hang around is a pretty expensive thing to have. Yeah, um, yeah, it's cool though, man. Um, cool. Well, so um, if we if we could, sorry, I don't know if you can hear a lawnmower right now. Can you hear it? Nope. Oh, excellent. My the uh, the muffler thing is doing its job. I assumed you could. Um, yeah. So if we could get, uh, so like I said, get a question. So I don't think we did this with your last one. We get like a question for the next guest to open the podcast. Um, See, you told me this at the start, and I, I should did. have been thinking of one this whole time, but I haven't been. I think it's more interesting though because you can use the conversation as your let's sort of take off ramp i guess if you want or you can just ask anything but you know um do, are you allowed to tell me who it is or do you know who it is or does uh, it, does it, does i think it's more interesting if i don't because you have to keep it a bit more okay. open-ended um okay. so uh i had a really funny one the other uh a couple episodes ago which was uh if you cloned yourself at work and 
promote the clone is that an hr violation that was the question <laughs> just there was the, the like i'll be honest the if you were to watch in the episode the whole cloning concept i had to i've had to veto a couple of questions and it was you can guess there was some unpleasant things happening with the clone and i was like i can't ask someone that <laughs> to open their podcast because it's like the first thing as well you know um well i've I just thought of one actually because we we were talking about this recently on tour and it just sparked this massive thing this massive debate that we talked about for like hours after that um what's your favorite crisps oh like brand and flavor and for the americans that's going to be chips isn't it oh yeah it's an american. The american i don't i don't know actually i can't remember oh, okay. who uh i can let's have a look i don't i don't know i think that only works if it's uk based no but you can, I can see chips can't i i think it is an american yeah. actually judging by my schedule right now um unless something get gets interrupted and something interrupts that in the next two days um so yeah that's a good one um sorry it wasn't as deep as the one you asked me <laughs> that's but. fine no i like variety though you know like um like a good packet of crisps good variety you need exactly. well what what is your favorite crisp? oh i'm oh i'm so like southern uk london i like like tyrrells and kettle chips and all of those the, the, posh, the posh, posh. posh crisps but they're just good like they're expensive oh, they are good they'll give you that they, I, I like the I really like the kind of the Tyrrell sweet chilli they're really good I like them I also like the uh, kettle any sweet chilli crisps I think that's just peak crisp flavour sweet chilli I don't know what it is that's good what about you? I have to go with just Walker's cheese and onion, like straight up Walker's cheese and onion. There's never enough. I could I could eat like four bags of them, and that's still probably not enough cheese and exactly. onion crisps. Though that's the only it's thing. Just, it's perfect. I'll give you a top three: those flavors <laughs> and salt and vinegar discos. That was my top three. I do like salt and vinegar. Actually, that's a good. What I find really satisfying. This is a good. If you're ever just like desperate for like Moorish food. Is cheddars, but like the big ones, or you can use the little ones, and like uh, sweet chili hummus. It's a weird mix. I don't know if it's a weird mix, but or any kind of hummus. Right. But I could just demolish. I could just eat them until I'm sick, probably. <laughs> and then yeah. That would be yeah. They're not like many cheddars are pretty special as well. Yeah, they're not like exciting, but I could just eat a huge amount of them. Um, I could probably eat my body weight in that. Yeah. Um, so I need an artist as well, like one you think deserves some love. Oh, let me just. Yeah, in fact, you can consult something. Something I've been listening to the last couple of days. It just came on my like release radar on Spotify. Bill Murray. Uh, not the actor. Oh, it's like that's good. I L M U R I. Apparently, someone told me is one of the guys from Attack Attack or something. Oh wait, how are you spelling that? B I L M U R I. Oh, I thought you meant. Yeah, I thought it was two. It's one word. No, no, one word. One word. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. I immediately went to. Funny enough, went to Zombie Land when he gets. Have you seen Zombie Land? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. When they shoot Bill Morris. Yeah, yeah. Brain went to that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. carry on. Yeah, they they've got a new song, "Living, Laughing, Loving." It's called. It's just like, it's not really. It's not metal at all. It's like funky, sort of poppy, emo -y rock. I don't know how else to explain it. Like, do you know the band Issues? Uh, it sort of yeah. reminds me of that. Yeah, I know of. I don't really listen. Can't say, but I know, I know of them. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Kind of gently, groovy. Just yeah, it's it's got groove, man. It's got some nice melodies going on, some saxophone, yeah. and then, and that's all. So I saw, I, I've been like jamming that for the last four days constantly. I saw uh, I saw Loathe the other day. They uh, they were so good live, like proper. Um, it was a really funny moment because I think. Um, uh, Eric, I think, is the guitarist, isn't it? But his guitar, something went wrong with his guitar. And then, like, not a moment later, the keyboard fell over. And it's just, like, kind of felt for him a bit. Um, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it had, like, like <clears throat> yeah the, the keyboard had, like, a red curtain kind of on the over the stand, so it didn't just look like a stand, you know. And as the keyboard fell, the curtain went, and, like, did a whole oh. sort of dramatic. <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, so, yeah, that was, yeah, that was cool. Is there anything you want to promote or sort of plug, plug to the world? Uh, oh no, I can't talk about that yet. We have something <laughs> we're announcing soon, which is cool. So you should cool. keep an eye on that. It will be. I mean, for perspective, I don't know how soon you'll be. This will probably be out like you know, just over a month. 
I don't know how safe that is, or if you even want to okay, tell so me. Okay, so I can I can talk about it. So it'll be at the. I can guarantee what this is. It, yeah, when's your announce? When is the announcement gonna? I'm, I'm just checking a date right now. Just yeah, because this will be. I think I think you're. We've got. Okay, August 9th. Oh yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. So, well, as long as you're happy telling me, you know, then you, um... yeah. Uh, we're releasing a deluxe edition of Shrine. Cool. It's got three new songs. But you have so, released, actually. Oh, no, you announced that you're releasing. Sorry. <laughs> we haven't we've announced nothing. We've announced nothing. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. But we will have by the time this is out. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's going to be a deluxe edition. There's three new songs. There's one, one of them is a new single. It's got a video. Um, so, yeah, that should be out now, I guess, by cool. the time this comes out. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to release it next week and get the scoop. I'm, I, I'm very excited for people to hear it because one of the, the, the main songs, like the single we're going with, I wanted to be on the album. And it didn't, it got swapped out for something else and I was like pretty gutted about it, but I was promised, oh no, we'll make a big thing about this later down the line. So this is the big thing that's been made about it. And yeah, I love this song. Yeah. Out of interest, why why did it not make the album? Did, is there just, is is there like another tune that kind of was better in its place or something just in the collection? Or Yeah, I think we wanted, we did want to save some songs to do something with later down the line, like a Docs edition or an EP or something. But, um, so we didn't want to just shoot our load and put every song that we thought were the best ones on the album we wanted to save a couple of the better ones to so that it would give a deluxe edition more of a a purpose rather than just oh it's the leftover songs it's mm. like that's actually songs that we love as well and we're excited for people to hear it so yeah yeah there's a couple of deluxe or like you know extended albums that i've heard where i kind of think oh, i feel like these are just the ones that you just scrapped you know or whatever so it'd be cool no it'd be cool to hear that man awesome Cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll finish up with that. Thank you, man. Great, man. Thanks for your time.